You're watching a special broadcast of Reality Check at a time when we're entering another cycle of the pandemic and another election cycle. It only brings into focus the complex nature of how we're engaging with the online space. On one hand, an enabling mechanism as we retreat from the physical world into the digital world. On the other, a toxic sinkhole of distraction and disinformation. How to negotiate this digital tightrope is the subject of a new book co-authored by Nandan Nilakani, one of India's digital pioneers, co-founder of Infosys and architect of Aadhaar. And he's uh, co-anchored it with Tanuj Bhojwani, described in the biography sent to us by the publishers as a storyteller who codes. He holds a chemical engineering degree from IIT, but he's also attended Ashoka University and studied liberal arts. Thank you both uh, so much for uh, joining us. Now, uh, First, just a quick question, uh, Nandan, Art of Bitfulness, that's the name of the book, The Art of Bitfulness, Keeping Sane in the Digital World, How to Take Back Control of Our Lives from the Internet. Um, a lot of people will be wondering, Art of Bitfulness, what does that mean? It means that you have to only consume digital in bits, is it, or pieces, or <laughs> is that the... Well, it's uh, a play on mindfulness and bit. Clearly, mindfulness is being present in what you're doing and similarly bitfulness is being present with your devices it's okay. also a play on that a bit of it is enough to make you feel much better so the art of bitfulness is mindfulness with the concept of a device and it's okay. based on the premise Srinivas that we cannot get away from technology but we should use it better okay got that now uh there's a, sort of an irony here, of course, that uh, you are one of the pioneers of digital India. Now you're saying find a way of spending less time online or, or at least try to regulate your uh, online space. What prompted you to, to get into this book? What prompted you to engage uh, with this idea? Also, I have been a you know, enthusiast for technology in transforming governance and corporations for the last 40 years. So that's very much what I believe in. But this book came out of the fact that during the pandemic, we have had to increase our interaction with devices because we now work, play, shop, order food, everything online. And we are essentially even more dependent on devices. And uh, I realized that we need to have some kind of guardrails, some kind of protocols, some kind of digital hygiene on how we use these devices as we go forward. Right. And I was doing a walk in the park with uh, Tanuj and realized that even though he's 30 years younger than me, he also had similar ideas. And mm -hmm. so we got together to write this book to give a sort of a way to do things so that you use your devices better and feel less right. stressed and remain calm. Okay. Um, let me ask both of you this, starting with you, Nandan. If one was to look at what happened in the digital space during this pandemic particularly, what would you say was one positive and what was one big area of worry or concern for you? I think one positive was that we learned that we could do so many things online uh, and not just you and me because we already use devices, but when a grandmother talks to her five-year-old grandchild or a, or a video call, mm. then that's a whole behavior change that has come about. And a part of that, of course, is the fact that in many professions now, you can work remotely. I think the, 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 bad, the, the thing that really hurt was that we lost social uh, connectedness and everything went digital and you know, mm. spending all day in front of the screen was, get, it was getting more and more difficult for people. And right. on top of that, we were playing games and doing this and that. So I think uh, the increase in the digital intensity was the worry something. Okay. Uh, Tanuj, same question. One positive, one big worry. I think negative is that uh, almost everybody I talk to, um, since it's become, it's scary to go outside. It's easy to work online. Uh, it's easy to sort of do events and things that you have done in person. We don't realize what we lose. We don't realize the value of those of those social interactions. What we learned, like uh, right. serendipitous encounters, uh, that I really miss. But the positive, if you ask me, was uh, even in the peak of all of this, we we saw volunteer groups come together, raise capital, put together oxygen uh, ration supplies for migrant workers, um, and to see all that in social media happening, sort of live, and everybody participating in that, I, I really thought that was a good use of the internet. Okay. Once. You, you know, Nandan, what I, I wanted to ask you that while 
it's true that you know spending too much time online staring at screens can be distracting it also has uh, you know implications on mental health on relationships and so on some may argue that in a country like india these are somewhat elite concerns uh, for a vast majority of indians just having digital access itself is a kind of privilege and this sort of digital divide came out most strikingly during the pandemic when it came to online learning right where uh, as we know and as it emerged vast numbers of the young children don't have or didn't have uh, access to uh, the internet a government report which came out in september said about 3 crore kids didn't have online access so that's so is that not a more i mean that's a serious challenge as well there's no question wasu that the access the dependence on digital technology for everything including education definitely creates a unlevel playing field especially for families and people who don't have access to devices so there's no doubt about that having said that i think the people who have devices have also built a lot of dependency on their devices and often they are not able to be in charge of their lives they are overwhelmed by what they're doing and this book is really a attempt to provide systems and not just depend on will power for people to use technology in a better way got it uh, the the other challenge uh, nandan of course is that the internet the social media as we experience it is largely through the gateway of you know four or five big tech companies social media including chat platforms like whatsapp and so on and as we've seen uh, social media has this negative side to it which you also address in the book where it has become a, a you know a swamp of bigotry misinformation propaganda and so on and while you have suggestions on how citizens should regulate their time and their engagement with the internet and with social media the bigger challenge again for countries like india for developing countries is how do you hold these big tech giants accountable because around the world now there's concern that this is actually impacting democracy itself social fabric democracy everything yeah was so we 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 have not really addressed that aspect because we think that's something which governments and regulators will think about but we have talked about an alternative way of technology in fact we have discussed two alternatives that are emerging one is the whole decentralized crypto model which mm. is now being called web 3.0 and the other is the digital public goods approach of india where we created platforms like aadhaar and upi and account aggregator which allows uh, a much more uh, uh, innovative and much more competitive uh, uh, you know approach because a, a lot of the challenges we have is because of the winner take all model of the internet which leads to a few players and mm. therefore we think that societies also have to create technical infrastructure to promote competition through interoperability so actually the second half of the book deals with how countries can think about creating more competitive interoperable systems right i i want to come to that in a second because india has had considerable success with that with aadhaar and uh, you know with the payments uh, infrastructure but even though you may not have directly tackled it in your book nandan what are your thoughts on this though what are your views on how you exactly try to regulate a uh, big tech it's a debate all around the world uh, the government itself often becomes a regulator but then there's also questions about the government's own position are they are they independent and neutral are they partisan themselves uh, you know so so what's the sort of tight rope here what's the what's the best way do you think of going about it well this is a very complex thing wasud i mean for example uh there are even ideological differences because the left may think that you uh you know you need to say what said on social media the right may say that's an infringement of free speech so it's a, it's a very difficult thing to do and uh, that's why our view is that rather than trying to regulate make it interoperable and be customers or consumers be able to switch from one one software to another Hmm. it's really that's how we create uh, you know some kind of balance tanuj any thoughts on this on, yeah i think uh, on, on big the, tech and yeah yes 
see i think uh, giving away a little bit of the book and what's in part 3 uh, of the book like nandan mentioned is that look these people are building the highways and the bridges and the ports of our digital world the question we should ask is uh, are we okay with them being the only ones building the only highway uh, for the digital world um, in india the government creates an alternative uh, but really like nandan is saying the the golden state would be that there are both public and private alternatives all of them work with each other you're not locked into any one and then the kind of control or power that they have over our lives through having control over this infrastructure uh, mm. will go away it's not going to happen tomorrow but we have right. to say that this is where we need to be in five years and start building that today right while while it's true uh, that it would be good to have those options nandan but the fact is that what we built in india doesn't quite uh, cover the areas of social media like there is no indian facebook or there is no uh, indian twitter or so on uh you actually spoken about this before why do you think that's been the case that while we've had such a robust innovative it space we have very exciting startups coming up why is it that india has not been able to create a, a facebook or a twitter it's got to do with the, with the business economics of it uh, vasu what happened was that the original sin of the internet was there was no model of transactions you couldn't really pay for either goods or services on the internet so in lieu of that they came out with the idea that you use advertising as a surrogate for making revenue so you show ads to people and then you know you charge the companies for the advertising and hmm. in the in the west you know this is a few hundred billion dollar market which was at that time on television and in print media and 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 you know so on that migrated and became digital advertising which drove the revenues for all these companies now india is a very very minuscule advertising market it's only about maybe 10 billion dollars of advertising of which digital advertising is only 2 or 3 billion dollars so there's just right. not enough revenue in our advertising business to create these giants so i personally feel that india will be a transaction first internet economy and that's where platforms like aadhar for identity and upi are now enabling people to do transactions today upi does 4.5 billion transactions a month and when i go for a walk i see the vegetable vendor is accepting upi payments and mm. npc's goal is to go to 1 billion a day so india will be a transaction led internet market not an advertising led internet market and right. these these companies came out of the advertising led world right when you talk of upi this is of course the the united or the unified payments unified interface payment interface from the national payment corporation of india which has been a national big success big success but the other side of course uh, of of too much digital dependency nandan and you've heard this argument of course uh, in all the time you've been associated with aadhar is that while of course the idea is that it cleans up databases it checks leakages but that can also be exclusionary that some of the people uh, you know who are excluded or who are rendered ineligible may actually be eligible and there are several studies which have come out which point to this also i think that's that's a, a lot of exaggeration there because today 1.3 billion people you know 1.2 billion 1.3 billion people have an aadhar then hmm. never in the history has there been such a ubiquitous inclusive program where 1.3 billion people have been reached it's been made very easy to get the aadhar number it's been made made very easy to change your details so actually a lot of effort has gone in. it's the simplest id to get in india today so actually sure. a lot of focus was on inclusion and that's reflected in the fact that in the state of aadhar report 92% of the people said that aadhar was beneficial to them okay i i think uh, you're right and then to the extent that aadhar itself as a identity has reached uh, billions of people i think the question that some raises uh, that when you link aadhar to the availing of benefits uh, whether that excludes people there was a study in 2020 by jpal which is of course the group set up by nobel laureate abhijit banerji in jharkhand pds which found that of those who were excluded it is a sample survey they found only 12% were legitimate exclusions 88% were actually genuine beneficiaries who got excluded well i don't know about this report but i think that it it's a lot depends on how you design it also it's not uh, it's not the technology itself how you design it and it can be designed to be very very inclusionary it allows you for example portability in mm-hmm. andhra pradesh 
you you can if you if you are you are in the village and your spouse is in the city you can both withdraw the pds so a lot of other benefits uh, i think if it is done well okay now of course uh, there's a, a move to link aadhar with the voter id which has led uh, you know some opposition parties and some internet freedom groups to raise concerns this could again they worry might lead to exclusions of voters what would your take be on this i think we need to understand what is the use of aadhar in uh, the election system it is not for the voting side of it it's not for uh, you know the polling booths it's not for deciding whether you vote and all that there are really two purposes both of which are actually uh, very very useful the first is to make sure that you have a single voter id because today india is a migratory country and people migrate around the country and end up with multiple voter ids so this will allow you to have make sure that everybody has a single voter id but more importantly it will be very very inclusive because migrants will now be able to vote much better today what happens is somebody from bihar comes to delhi he is not able to get his name put on the delhi electoral roll so he becomes a, a non citizen of delhi and therefore his vote does not count and therefore mm. if you want to give migrants a vote we have to make it easy for them to register in the new city where they are and that's where this will help very well so it's actually very very inclusionary and will change the whole urban uh, politics because migrants will be able to vote on an equal footing right but the concern that in the event that the aadhar id doesn't get authenticated as we know there have been issues uh, whether it is to do with biometrics or technology and so on uh, there could be you know signal failures and so on and so forth that might lead to exclusions no there's no there's no authentication here uh, at the time of voting uh, and that all the voting is done with the traditional voter list you come to the booth where you are they'll check the voter list and you vote in the evm that right. side of does not change at all this is a one time thing for example if i move from bihar to delhi hmm. i first go to the aadhar system and do an aadhar online address update and then i'll go to the voting system and say please update my voter list to show this new address and once i'm the new address then i'll go into the local voting uh, voter list after which it's right. the same system okay so you're saying that the risks of exclusions are perhaps exaggerated but overall uh, and then when you say that there is the model in india has been much more to build these uh, you know sort of payment uh, linked architectures uh, several of them are uh, government funded and backed uh, you know even the gst the it portals all of these are huge exercises in technology um, but is there a risk to that as well nanan when you're working like infosys works with the uh, the government has been working with gst has been working on the it portal uh, is there a reward but also a risk because when it comes to the government there are glitches then there's a backlash and all of that well i think you know uh, we are all doing it for a national purpose i think india has hugely benefited from uh, a single tax system before gst came along every state had a different system now over the country we have a single system that has helped in creating a single market uh, the income tax uh, also the uh, the revenues are going up uh, so i think all these are obviously large uh, complex systems but they're all beneficial and india has actually become a role model in the world on new mm. technology for improving governance and i would say overall it has been a very good story over the last decade okay i was also referring to this you know it was kind of ridiculous that there were glitches uh, i think with gst and it systems and then you had this absurd thing where some rss link journalist targeting infosys saying you know this is anti national well you know look in the public domain all kinds of uh, things happen i think we have to just be be calm remember the book be calm in the digital world <laughs> that's true keep calm and carry on <laughs> absolutely <laughs> i think that's that's quite important uh, in terms of trying to sort of uh not get too impacted by all of this but that's the challenge in fact you know tanuj when i was talking to somebody one of my young producers saying this is a thing that we're discussing they were saying look it's all very well to say you should log out check out but all of us some of us professionally are so hardwired to this technology all the time that how can you really afford to log off 
uh, so the idea is not afford to log off. You decide. We, we don't have a prescription. We don't say uh, you must be online only one hour a day or anything. There's no such idea. The question that we try to answer is, suppose you want to, let's suppose you want to say, I want to take the next two hours, not get bothered, be calm. Do we even know how to do that anymore? Do we even know how to actually switch off? Uh, and we, we try to sort of help you. There's no hacks in this book. There are systems, right? We try to tell you, here is how you can set up your devices, your time online, such right. that when you want to be focused, you're focused. When you want to play, you're playing. When you want to catch up on the news, you're catching up on the news. Okay. So it's, it's a way of managing uh, your time and, and your engagement with these devices. But uh, let me ask you in conclusion, though, Anandan, because increasingly, as we mentioned at the outset, as we move towards uh, an economy which is not often these days very much the physical economy, the bricks and mortar, because of the pandemic, there's this constant retreat. How do you see this challenge playing out? Because the economy is uh, going through a phase of turbulence. I'm sure all sectors would have been impacted, including, I expect, uh, you know, the IT sector as well. Uh, do you see the turmoil, the churn still quite serious or do you see things turning around? Actually, I'm quite very bullish about the future, uh, Vasu, I think, and technology will play a big role in it. The first is, of course, we're seeing the enormous growth in uh, startups. And, you know, I meet a lot of young people. I live in Kodavangla, which is the epicenter of the startup world. I meet a lot of young people with great enthusiasm, ambition, and idealism. Uh, and they want to build some really useful technology. So that's one good news. Mm. The second is the global demand for India's technology skills is going up dramatically. Uh, and it's expected that, you know, the number of jobs in this industry will go from 5 million to 10 million over the next decade. And that right. will drive a lot of economic growth. And the third is that India's digital public goods, whether it's Aadhaar or UPI or account aggregator, will help in dramatically democratizing access to technology and services for the people. So I think in three different ways, hmm. technology will be an impl uh, in, uh, in explicit part of India's economic revival post the pandemic. Okay. Because... Uh, at the moment, though, if you look at the various indicators and reports coming out, it does suggest that there is quite a challenge. The latest was this report, I don't know if you had a chance to look at it, uh, World Economic Forum, you know, which hosts the annual Davos summits. They come up with this global report countrywide, and they pointed to the serious challenges in India, one of which they say is that there's a huge population of the unemployed, the youth is restless, they feel, uh, you know, there's a sense of disenfranchisement from the way that the country, the economy is progressing. So these are also very immediate real world challenges as well. No, I look, we, we have a very young population. They have, their aspirations have been unleashed thanks to television and, uh, and the internet. Uh, we have to create more job creating engines. I think these are all challenges that we have, but I think we have to focus on what we can do. And I personally feel that India is sitting in a good place. Manufacturing is now taking off. Uh, people are looking at China plus one strategy where they find they can't put all their you know, manufacturing in one country. They're looking at alternatives. So this is a good time. And I think we all have to work together to take the full advantage so that right. millions of Indians benefit from uh, progress in the coming years. Okay. Well, as we wrap, just need to ask you, uh... And then that as far as the, as far as the digital uh, interaction of uh, your own digital interaction is concerned, uh, I, know, I, I noticed that you're not on WhatsApp, so you've already managed to scale back a bit. Uh, I was but, never on uh, WhatsApp, by the way. By you, were, you were never on WhatsApp, unlike uh, the rest of us, for better or for worse. Uh, but, but have you managed to practice what you preach? Are you oh, less I'm... of a digital addict now because of all this yeah, yeah. business? Or you? No, no, absolutely. I have simple principles. I have a laptop. I do all my serious work on my laptop. Mm. I only do uh, for a voice and SMS on my phone. I don't use any social media. I use Twitter only to broadcast my ideas. Uh, right. I use my iPad for uh, reading my... I only read uh, subscription stuff. I don't read uh, fake news and free news. So, and I have a zero, in, I have a zero inbox email strategy. So... I very much practice this, and that's the reason I'm calm in this world. <laughs> okay. Tanuj, uh, is that, that's not realistic for everybody, but are you, what is your quick mantra? Have you also become somewhat of a digital monk? 
Or no, I mean, you... look, I'm not an expert. The idea is that we struggled in the pandemic more right. as much as everybody else did. And that's why we wrote this book as learners, right? Like, here's what we learned by talking to people. Okay. Um, I have definitely cut down uh, sort of activities that were harmful. The simplest of which was my TV is now here as opposed to being in my bedroom, uh, which right. I used to put on every night and then waste two hours and then sleep less and be frazzled and be, you know, overwhelmed the next day. It's just okay. the simple things, right? It makes a difference. Simple things makes a difference. That's very true. But anyway, it's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Nanda Nilikani and uh, Tanuj Bojwani for joining us. Thanks very well, much. Thank indeed. you, Vasu. Thank you for thank you. giving us a chance. Thanks.